Hello, welcome back to uh, this week's uh, lecture on uh, statistical analysis, in which we're going to look at descriptive analysis. And uh, in, in this last or the third section, we're going to look at uh, the analysis of how you do statistical uh, analysis. So in most, with me again, Yanto Chandra, there's in most social science research, uh, the statistical analysis follows these three major steps in this order, right? So first of all, let's say you have you have collected the data, right? You have you have you have, you have thought about your research question. You have, you have thought about your research model. You know the rubbers and the relationship that you want to test. You have specified your hypothesis, and then you have done your sampling. You have spread out your questionnaire. Or you have done your experiment. You collect your data. You have them in your ex, you have them in the your Excel or SPSS data. And the next part is you need to think about. Um, so there are three types for this. So let's say you have this data already. So first of all, you need to do what we call data preparation. So what is data preparation? Is a stage where you do the cleaning and organizing your data, right? And once you've done that, you go to the second step to do descriptive statistics, which we have just uh, shown you just now. So you describe your data using like frequency analysis, like means and means median mode and uh, you know, do the box plot and, and standard deviation, variance, correlations, chi-square, and those sort of things. And then you follow up to do your inferential statistics. And you use inferential statistics in order to test your hypothesis and your models. So these three major steps, and there are smaller steps in each of them. So in data preparation, uh, a number of key things that you need to do. So so uh, it, it really depends on how you capture your data. Let's say, let's say you capture your data uh, using paper-based survey. So you you put you print your survey on a piece of paper, and you ask people to fill it in, right? So once people fill it in, typically somebody need to enter this data into the Excel or spreadsheet, right? Respondent one on variable A and B and C and D. So you need to enter their value for each of these variables for each person. And then you have, let's say 300 people up to the 300 respondent. You need to enter variable A, what is the value, variable B, C, D, et cetera, right? So the important part is you need to check the data, check for accuracy. Try to see if there's something missing there because oftentimes there is something missing. Why, why do you think would respondents what, what would you think you have some missing data? What could be the reason? I'll just give you the clue. <laughs> Respondents is doing something. Respondents may, may pers purposefully, deliberately avoid it to answer your question in the, in, the, in, the, in the survey. So when they purposefully left blank, then you have a missing data. Right? That's why some people prefer online survey because you can force your respondents to actually fill in something. And some people just totally forgot. They skip it. They Because they read too quickly, they skip the questions. That's why they didn't fill in, in some parts. So it becomes some blank there. So it's got missing data. You enter the data. And then if the data is not in the right format, it's not in the right structure, you need to transform the data. We're going to look at it in a, in a moment. Important part of data preparation is to have a code book. But what normally people do and what I, what I would also do is to develop the code book even before I conduct the research, before I conduct the survey or the experiment, because the code book is the roadmap. It tells you overall, where am I going and how am I going to get there? So code book is like a super, very important formula. So, so in terms of code book, uh, some people use Word file, some use Excel. I like to use Excel because it's very clear. And what is a code book is, it gives you the uh, descriptions about all the variables that you are studying and how you measure them and the type and the coding instructions and, and how people will uh, fill in that information. So for example, you can have the variable name, the description of that variable, the format, is it number, is it text and data, how you collect it? Uh, maybe if there's some groups for them of the response, group one, group two, group three, or maybe their location where you store it, encoding instructions. Some Sometimes like, for example, uh, like gender, you may code it or you measure it as a one, 
you measure is male and female, right? You measure male and female is categorical, but when you code it into numbers, you need to give a number to male and female. So that is how, that is how uh, categorical variables can be analyzed quantitatively and statistically. Because what you do is you turn those categories into numbers. Like male becomes one, females become two, or you can even you can make male as zero and female as one. It's, it's not a problem because the, the, the result will be following that. And let's say marital status, for example, uh, single, steady, relationship, married, remarried, divorced, widow. And you can give numbers to each of them. So this is how you transform uh, qualitative information, like whether people are single or married or whatever, into some numerical numbers. And you use that numerical numbers in the statistics. So, so code book is really important. So this is one example of code book. They have a, they have a name for the uh, short, a short version of the variable's name. Why do you use a short version for the variable name? Like, I, like sex, race, region, happy, life. Uh, look at, look, when it's getting longer, look at that more interesting. E EDUC, EDUC, education completed. Why don't you write education completed? Why don't you write May uh, mother, highest highest year of school for the mother, which they write is M-A-E-D-U-C, mother education completed. Because when you run it on SPSS or you run it on your R to do the analysis, you don't want the statistical packages to give you a very long description of the variable because they will give you the variable name and the output. But it's better to use a simplified name for the variable, like occupational prestige. This researcher is using prestg 80 So, and a number of children, child S. So, with a simplified version for the variable name, and then you have a fuller description of the, of the of the variable, what it really means. Happy means general happiness. Uh, ADUC, EDUC is actually highest year of school completed. That's what it means. And you have the value label, which is the, act the actual way that you transform the measurement into some numbers. Let's say male becomes one, female becomes two. Uh, in terms of race, white becomes one, male become, uh, black becomes two, other becomes three, and things like that. And you have the data, you have checked the data, and then you enter the data into SPSS or Excel. What I would do normally is to enter into Excel first because uh, it's a lot easier to work with in Excel. And once you have entered your raw data into Excel, it's still in a raw data because there may be something missing, there may be something that's not right. But the first step is to enter into Excel and then you can do some manipulation later. In SPSS, it also helps you to do some manipulation. So you can do manual data entry, typically if your data is captured in a very traditional manual paper and pencil questionnaire. So people fill in your questionnaire uh, on a paper and you need to type it, right? Uh, is there a pros and cons for this? Um, I see a lot of cons rather than pros using a paper and pencil. So, so I've seen a uh, few and few people are using paper and pencil unless it's really, really necessary, unless there's no better option because the process of entering uh, the raw data, you know, the people, what people fill in the question and you enter that into the Excel spreadsheet. The process of entering this is very prone to error. Let's say if you have hundreds and hundreds of survey to fill in and each survey is not just one piece, one survey can have three pieces or five pieces and a lot of questions and the sub, the people who enter this could make mistakes and that will be uh, some error, a potential error that you want to avoid. I would use uh, automated approach. For example, if I collect data using Qualtrics, which is a software, or SurveyMonkey, or Google Forms, you can create your question in Google Forms as well. And you, you, you lay out your question, you define your variables and your how you're going to measure them. And after people fill it in, uh, X, uh, the Google will immediately give you your, your raw data in terms of a spreadsheet, in terms of rows of observations and columns, right? And with that, you can just copy or save as uh, Excel file, and then you can do the next uh, in your in your SPSS or, or in R. 
And once you do the data entry, or once you have the data in a spreadsheet, the important part is to check data accuracy. For example, you ask about people's age, and someone put 601. Is, this, is anyone whose age is 601? Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe the average lifespan of human, or the highest human lifespan is maybe about 120 years old. 600 years old is very unlikely for human lifespan. So if you see some, some, some answers in a survey of people's age that is written as 601, this is likely to be error. Maybe this person is 60 years old or 61 years old, but there's additional one or additional zero was entered. So it, it becomes 601. Or your measurement scale is one to five. You ask people, do you agree with this statement or not? One totally disagree, five totally agree. And someone put a number of seven. So this is totally out of range from the scale that you are asking them to fill in. So, so this is something that you need to be aware of. Now, if you have missing values, what do you need to do? So this is a part of what we call data transformation. So when you have missing values in your Excel, so actually what I do before I do the analysis, I will just use a visual scan. If my data is not very large, I can quickly scan it using my eyes. But if I have like thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of rows of observations, as you have a millions of individuals who respond to your survey or or you're analyzing from social media data, you have hundreds of thousands or millions of people that you're studying, it's definitely impossible to use hand, to use visual inspection. But if you can, you can do that. But typically when you have missing values, uh, the statistical software program will automatically treat it as uh, something missing. <clears throat> and if you have a missing value, one of the things that you can do is you assign a very strange value, let's say 999 or 99999, very long trigger, just to make it very different from the other values that you capture for each variable, right? And of course, there's a lot of reasons why you have missing values in your in your survey or your experimental data. Some people were not asked the question, so is the researcher's mistake? Or you, the researcher asked the question uh, in the questionnaire, but Respondents ignore it or skip it. They don't want to answer it. First of all, it's uh, information that are quite sensitive to them. They will totally skip. They will, not they will not answer those questions. Or someone who entered the data in the Excel, they made some mistakes. Uh, and it could be equipment. Let's say your research requires some instrument to, to measure something. Let's say you are measuring uh, uh, people's uh, pulse or something to measure people's uh, ECG or EEG or different, or even the skin conductance. So there are some equipment that people use to measure people's body. Or in the paper that I get you guys to read on uh, the voice, the voice of the CEO, right? If the equipment to capture the voice is not precise, that could be a mistake by itself, right? So, so that's what it looks like. So when you, when you have seen something in SPSS, you've seen some dots, 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 those are actually the missing values. And you need to do something about it. So what do you do when you have missing value? Typically, one way is you can delete or remove the things that are missing. But this really depends on whether your sample size is big enough or not. If you have, let's say, thousands and thousands of, of respondents in your survey or in your experiment, and there are just a few of them, you can just remove them without worrying too much. But basically there are two types of how you want to remove, how you want to deal with missing values in terms of removing them. The first is called least wise deletion. So in least wise, you remove the entire row of observation or that particular individual whenever there is something empty. So for example, the second person there who is a female who made a sales of 280 because this person didn't put a, f a number for the manpower. I don't know what it means, manpower, but there's something missing there. So in least-wise deletion, you, you remove the entire person from your uh, data set in, a, in the Excel. And also the one at the bottom that has a 26 and 259, the second from the bottom. And there's no gender there. So you can also remove it totally. But this is uh, 
and this could lead to you removing too much of your samples. If your samples is not big enough, remember, sample size is important because it relates to statistical power. When your sample size is too small, your statistical power will be too low. Or in other words, the ability of your instrument to capture reality is very weak and is very prone to error. So you want to have larger sample. Right? So when your sample size is not too big, you could consider using a pairwise deletion. So what is a pairwise deletion? Pairwise deletion, basically you only remove that particular variable from that particular individuals. But you don't remove this particular individual's answer on the other variables. So for example, the second person from the top is a female, but this person didn't fill in the, 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 second, the first variable called manpower. And but fill in on the sales two eight zero, so you can only you can you can remove for pay paywise deletion. You can ask SPSS to remove only that particular empty part. So it will not remove. So so if your original sample size is one hundred, when you remove one two, one two three four, it will not remove anyone. It only remove a certain type. So when you calculate the total sample size for manpower, you have one hundred less two person. When you talk about sales, you have 100% less one person because one is removed. And we have gender, you have one, 100 less one person, which is only 99. So that's the difference between pairwise or listwise. So SPSS use this term. Uh, when you have missing value, you can also consider using median or mean replacement. Think about it. You have something missing. One way is to remove them. But if you don't remove them, you can fill in that missing value with some numbers. Uh, the question is what number you use. So you could use a mean value, the average for that particular variable or the median value. So when you put the mean value or the median value, I think you, 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 you can guess what is the purpose. Why, why don't you put um, maximum value or minimum value, a range, minimum to maximum. Let's say drinking water. You ask people about how many cup, how many cups of water do you drink from zero to uh, fifty cups per day, right? You will not put zero fifty. You could put the mean value or the median value, because you want to ensure that the missing value that you impute with the mean or median as a replacement does not skew your your data or does not change a lot in terms of the uh, dispersion of the data from the mean value. So. From, from the middle part or the mean value or the median value. So uh, one way is what I call general imputation. So for example, for the variable called manpower, if there's something missing, you, you can calculate the mean value for, for that variable in SPSS or in Excel. And then you tell, you can do it manually or you can tell SPSS to input that missing value with that 28.33. So every missing part of manpower will be filled in automatically with 28.33. And if, but if you have a sep, separate uh, sections or separate groups, like for gender, if you have gender, male, female, uh, and then you have a certain value for uh, manpower for male and female, right? Then you can instruct the SPSS to give you a number. For example, give 29.75 for, uh, for the male's manpower or give uh, 25, score of 25 for female manpower, then it will automatically fill in that. So with that, then you have a complete set of data and you can run analysis. The one on the left there is just example that they, they replace everything with a single average or mean value, which is 4.71. So you can see the blank become a new one, but typically in SPSS, it will not directly replace uh, the variables, the original variables. So the original variables and the missing values will be retained there. So this is how SPSS works. And if you want to do this replacement, SPSS will ask you to create a new column. And that helps you check whether the things that you have replaced really work and you can compare it with the original. So you can do the column to column comparison. So this is why uh, it's very useful to, to, to make this kind of comparison. Now, another kind of transformation that you need to do in your data is when your measurement uh, is a little bit inconsistent with other measurements. For example, typically when you, you, you have a number from let's say one to five or one to six, typically one is typically less favorable, six is more favorable, or even one to five, one to seven, typically the smaller the number, 
the numerical value is less favorable, and the larger the value is more favorable. But sometimes some some uh, some researchers by mistake or on purpose, there's a good reason to do this. Uh, for example, you want to do attention check on the people who fill in your your survey or your questionnaire. Uh, you may want to ensure that some of the variables are not exactly in the same uh, consistency. Um, just, just give you just one example here. So let's say in a positive coding, typically one is totally disagree. As you go to number five, it's totally agree, right? One to five, right? Six is don't know. So it's actually one to five, right? And let's say you have measured in the reverse way, you have measured this variable in terms of one means totally agree and five totally disagree, right? So if you have this one totally agree and five totally disagree, this does not fit with the, the other variables uh, way of measurement, then you need to reverse this item. So you need to reverse this negative coding to positive coding. So you can reverse that in SPSS by telling SPSS to change. Help me change. So three becomes three. Uh, two becomes four, eh? once become five, eh? and four becomes uh, two, and five becomes one. So you reverse them. So, and, and aspects can do that for you, relatively easy. And with that, then you, are, you feel safe, then you can continue. But in certain variables that people have used in the past, I think it's a variable called attitude towards something, attitude toward advertising or attitudes toward dog or something, which have, we have looked at a few a few weeks ago. So most of the items are measured in a positive coding, but some of the items were measured in a negative or reverse coding. And there's a purpose for that, for attention check. Because when response are filling the, the questionnaire, in, whether it's in a survey or in an experiment, some people just quickly run it, they want to finish it as soon as possible without thinking much. And that is a trap that you as a researcher can set to trap, to check whether people are really reading your questions carefully or not. When they get trapped with your, with your, with your trap, you, you check, you know that, ah, this, they, they didn't read. They just say, good, 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 good. Or they say, very good, very good, very good. Where in fact, the question is, you know, do, do you like to be paid very little? They say very good, very good, very good. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense with the other variable that you asked them, in which they they like to to have more than to have less. So, 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 so these are the things that you can do. Another very useful type of data transformation is what I call numeric transformation. One type of this numeric transformation is called log n. There's also another type of log n or ln, but this log ten is something that you may have learned in high school. So when your data is not distributed, you can transform it. So for example, your data is 4.5, 16.3, 25.3, 2713.3. Look at how this data is, is impossible to think of this as a normally distributed data because the, the range is so big and some of them is very small, some of them very big. It's, like, it's just totally random numbers, right? So when you have a data like this, if you want to make your data more normally distributed, you, you, you ask SPSS to transform each of these raw data into a log 10 of each one of them. So once you enter that function in SPSS, it automatically gives you the number. For example, 4.5, log 10 of this is 0 0.65. 60.3, the log 10 of it is 1.21. If you don't know what it is, uh, if you have a um, scientific calculator, which I, I do have, I like scientific calculator because it's uh, very useful. For example, you want you want to test this. You can you can test this. Turn it on. Oop, can you see that? Yep. So I will start with, uh, let's say, uh, log of one thousand. Let's say there's a score one thousand there, right? Log of one thousand, right? So I just go to on. Turn it on, right? I go for log. Can you see log? Lock, put 1000, one, zero, 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 close the bracket. Okay, press enter. Three. So that's exactly the same as the example that I put there. So you can also do that on a calculator if you want. Also, there's a link that I, that I put there. They can do the, the, the transformation. 
So what happens after you use the log transformation to your data set? So if your data set is possibly skewed like that, then it, it helps your data to be a little bit more normally distributed. It may not be perfectly distributed, but it's positified. It make it more positive instead of instead of going a lot. So it actually, this is a lot more going a bit more uh, negatively skewed, but it's still better than the original one on the left. On the left is just totally skewed, and uh, you know most likely you you can't get a good result or you cannot interpret the results with confidence if your data is looking on the left. But if your data is more on the right, you can have more confidence to interpret your, your findings. So this, I think, uh, near the last part, we're talking about the descriptive versus inferential statistics. So this week, in these three videos, I've talked about descriptive statistics. So descriptive, descriptive statistics help you describe your data using some basic information that provides simple summary of your sample of the variables that you are measuring. And you use mean, mode, median, standard deviation, variance, correlation, chi-square. And of course, I talk about box plots and uh, quartiles and decimals, percentiles. Uh, in the following weeks, we're going to look at inferential statistics. So what's inferential statistics? is the kind of statistics that you use to test or verify your models or hypothesis in order for you to make inferences. What is inference? Inference means you make a conclusion based on a small set of data so that the small set of data that you're studying allows you to project it into the, the broader population. Okay. Uh, so we're gonna so for example, examples of inferential statistics include different types of regression, bivariate regression, regression using uh, uh, just two variables, or multivariate regression. We have multiple variables in the regression. You can use logic. We have a logistic regression and uh, uh, as, as well and structural equation modeling, and you can do t-test and f-test or ANOVA. You can capture all this z-test and also conjoint analysis. So, so these are the types of inferential statistics. So let me bring this to a summary. Uh, so descriptive statistics that we have talked through today help you have a feel about your data before you do serious analysis, like using regression to test your hypothesis. And, Descriptive analysis, descriptive statistics is something that you can actually calculate by hand if you want to, or using Excel. But it can also be calculated using any of the popular statistical software like SPSS or R. And there are a few very commonly used uh, descriptive statistics like mean, standard deviation, uh, correlation, variance, and 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 um, and also different type of quartiles in your in your box plot and frequency counts, counts and frequencies, right? And percentages. And uh, not, the, not, not all variables can be measured using mean, right? For example, a gender of 0 0.65. How do you interpret that? Okay, z gender. Maybe you measure uh, female is 0, male is 1. But if you get an average score of gender 0 0.65, it might be a little bit Difficult to uh, to to understand, you know, the gender in your the distribution of gender in your sample. Maybe you could use median or mode. All right. What about age? Age twenty seven point eight. Still better. Still better than you know a gender of one point two. Let's say you measure male female as one and male as two, and you have a sample size average for gender is one point two. So at, at least a number of twenty seven point. To 27 points, 27.8, a little bit better. But even for age, if you think very carefully, does it make sense to say someone has an age of 27.8? It's better to say the person has an age of 27 or the average sample is 27 or 28 years old rather than 27.8. But again, uh, that, that's, that's, that's up for us to, to make interpretation. And then not all variables can be measured using correlation because correlation requires uh, interval and, and metric scale. Uh, some of them are using nominal or categorical scale. And that's where chi-square is very useful. And then your data may not always be very clean. That's why you need to do some data transformation. You may have missing values. You need to do something about it. Uh, replacement with some, some values or you need to remove some part. And also, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So uh, about half of the statistical work 
is done in the data cleaning and describing the data, right? And if you don't collect the right data, if you don't do the right way of cleaning your data, your output will be garbage. So you have garbage in, you have garbage out. But if you have uh, diamond in, you have diamond out. So you produce diamond as the input and you're gonna produce diamond as the output. Hopefully that's useful for you all. And thank you very much. Bye.